By Williams' final years at St. Andrews he had long since given up the baseball cap. Head up, he walked tall and confidently through the town, popped in and out of shops, pubs and cafes with scarcely a second thought, and where he had once been a bit of a passenger in seminars and tutorials, he began to speak up. His tutors all noticed him growing before their very eyes and taking a genuine interest. Having dropped history of art, he was concentrating on more advanced physical geography, which he found much more exciting. The bits of the course that got him most motivated, says John Walden, were those that had a social context. He did a course on HIV and AIDS and he got really interested in that because he could see in the outside world where that was an issue. He did a course with Dr. Charles Warren, a colleague, on environmental management in Scotland, and they're a family with a country tradition, and he was really interested in that. The other piece of independent work was a review essay on some issue to do with big game hunting in Africa and the damage that that is doing to populations of big game. Charles Warren found William strikingly humble. I formed a very high opinion of him as a man with his feet on the ground, earthed and normal always a pleasure to deal with and interact with. He had no sense of entitlement, was never pushy. He was an outstanding young man by any standards but the fact that he's had all that privilege and extraordinary life, yet he was most normal. Whoever the people were that had a hand in bringing him up, they deserve a lot of credit. When it came to roll calls, for security reasons William's name never appeared on any lists. Charles remembers William and another boy turning up late one day in the second year, and without looking up he said, names please. William's companion sang out his name, while William kept his mouth firmly shut. The look on his face said, you're not expecting me to say my name, are you? He was embarrassed, he hated standing out. In June 2004, Charles took 15 junior honors students, including William, on a field trip to the Jostadalen ice cap in western Norway, which is the biggest and most dramatic in mainland Europe. It is one of the most beautiful places on earth, particularly at that time of year, with spring in the valley floor but snow still on the mountains. It is also one of the most remote. Their base was at a self-catering campsite that belonged to a small hotel in the tiny settlement of Jurd and every day they walked up the valley to the field site on the eastern flank of the ice cap to measure, record and map where the glaciers have been in retreat to establish the evolution of the landscape. William came alive in those surroundings. No one knew where he was. The British media knew he was out of the country but they had no idea he was in Norway. There was not a photographer within hundreds of miles and Charles says he had never seen him so relaxed. It was great to see. He was in an environment he loved. He loves wild places. We talked a lot about Patagonia, which he had also really loved. I had been a scientific leader on a number of Raleigh expeditions to Chile so I knew exactly the places he was talking about. At night, over hearty stews provided by the hotel, where the staff were ensconced, while the students roughed it on bunks and wooden cabins, cooking breakfast and lunch for themselves, William let his hair down. He's a born raconteur, says Charles. He told some highly entertaining anecdotes about the goings-on behind the scenes at Royal Dose, the imminent disasters and chaos. There is this image he painted of the swan effortlessly gliding past while lots of frantic paddling is going on underneath the surface of the water. He told them in such an amusing and entertaining way, we were all in stitches of laughter. Unhappily, the idol was cut short. Protocol insists that if a member of the British royal family is visiting another country, even in a private capacity, the government has to be informed. Word filtered down from Oslo to the local policeman, and somewhere along the line, someone leaked it to the Norwegian press. The party woke up on day three to find the peaceful little settlement of Jurd had become a media city. There were television trucks with satellite dishes and radio cars and print journalists and photographers crawling all over the place. William's security people negotiated a deal that if he walked from the cabins down to the main street and they got their shot, they would all go away. Which they did, except for one independent guy who stuck with us, but finally William's PPOs lost him. What struck me most was the change that immediately came over William. On went the cap pulled well down, the head went down. 
You could see him putting on his psychological armor. I found it profoundly sad. It was a tiny glimpse of what happens to him every day of life. The intense weight of the world on his shoulders. Two days before the end of the trip, William had to leave. He had sad news. His grandmother, Frances Shand Kidd, had died at her home near Oban on the Isle of Sile off the west coast of Scotland. She was just 68 and had become a rather tragic figure. The last time she had appeared in public was at the Burrell trial as a witness for the prosecution, when under oath she had been forced to admit that she and Diana had been estranged for four months before her daughter's death. They had had no contact. Life had been very hard on her. She had endured an unhappy marriage, lost custody of her children when they needed her. Her second husband, Peter Shandkid, had left her in 1986. Her brother had committed suicide two years before and she had buried two children, the newborn son and Diana. It was not surprising that she should have turned to two of life's great comforters, religion and the bottle. When she returned to Scotland after Diana's funeral she was trapped indoors for 11 days by reporters. And after the Burrell trial, she found she had been burgled in her high-profile absence and had her jewellery stolen. She had been living as a recluse for many years in a two-roomed bungalow, doing relentless charity work, supported by the local community in Oban and by the Roman Catholic Church. She once said, It takes very little to make you happy if you've had real sadness. It makes you take less for granted, and it's a very enriching experience, really. Her funeral at St. Columbus Cathedral a week after her death was a large gathering of the Spencer clan. The Prince of Wales, her former son-in-law, was not there, according to the Daily Mail, because he had not been invited. The rift between the older generation had never healed and Earl Spencer's promise at Diana's funeral to be there for the princes had turned out to be little more than rhetoric. He had pledged that their blood family would do all they could to steer their lives so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition but can sing openly as you, Diana, planned. William, who had returned from Norway, and Harry, who had flown back from Africa, both looked immensely sad. They hadn't seen much of their grandmother in recent years but they had happy memories of times with her and holidays spent on Sile when they were younger. She and Diana had been alike in so many ways and she had been a reassuring link to their mother's memory.